Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Izzy Fuqua. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator for the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and I get to work with wonderful colleagues like curators and educators um, on this monthly gallery program that we are able to offer virtually. Uh, today, we are joined by Dr. John Henry Rice, um, our curator for the uh, South Asian collection, and he will be presenting on three works of art, um, specifically new installations in the late Indian gallery. So with that, John Henry, I'll turn it over to you. All right, um, thank you, Izzy, and, and hello, everybody out there. This is my first um, virtual 3 and 30 talk. I Izzy was actually just reminding me, um, apparently, of, of, a, of a 3 and 30 I did years ago that went on for forever, so I, I will endeavor not, not to do that to you today and stick to the, the time frame here. Um, the, the impetus for this particular program um, is um, or, or was um, some renovations that are going on in the South Asian galleries, um, particularly in the, the late Indian gallery and, and in fact spilling over into uh, the pavilion gallery. So, so you know, ordinarily if we were together, I would be taking you up to the third floor to the South Asian galleries. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of do that virtually here. I would I'd take you, you know, in, in through the sculpture gallery and then uh, through the pavilion gallery, I think um, that orients people pretty well. If you know where you are when, when you're in, in, in the pavilion gallery. Um, just to note, as part of these renovations, this uh, pavilion gallery will um, be repainted. And I'm actually really excited about that. All the art will be installed except for the pavilion. And, and these, these um, sort of sandy uh, Eddie Bauer khaki walls will be, will be repainted a, um, a very, very light blue that, that's meant to sort of evoke the, the, the sky and, and I think will work very well with the, the pavilion, which of course was, was once outdoors under the sky. But I would take you through the, the pavilion gallery and then to the doorway into the late ending gallery. Um, I think most of you will recognize the howda, the, the silver elephant saddle there. And I'd take you into here and then ask you to, to turn to the right um, where um, this is what it currently looks like. And um, the wonderful Lockwood de Forest chairs are there. Um, uh, a Kashmiri shawl we recently installed behind those. Um, you can see off in the distance there, um, the uh, peacock feather uh, fly whisks, um, and, which I'll return to uh, at some point. And then as you can see, currently there are paintings on, on these walls, but, but soon we will get new casework in this, uh, in this area to rehouse the, um, some of our Anglo-Indian silver collection, which is currently on the, on the other side, the north side of the gallery. There's a, a view of that there. And so um, this material will be, will be moving into new cases um, in the southern half. And, um, the, the, the silver that we currently have installed really only represents about maybe, maybe not even a quarter of the colonial Indian silver in our collection. So all of this will be moving um, to, to the south end of the gallery and will be joined by, um, by, by other great things that have not been out, um, that have been in storage. And one of those is the first of the three objects that I'd like to talk to you about. And it's um, this wonderful tea service. So back in 2011, uh, we acquired a really exceptional collection of colonial Indian silver, which had been assembled by Paul Walter of New York City. And at that time, Mr. Walter promised to us the, the really the most spectacular example in his collection, which is this sublime five piece tea service. Um, and following his untimely death, uh, this, this tea service entered our collection in 2019. And so this is the first time it will be on view um, since, since being acquired. Um, the production of colonial Indian silver was concentrated in really just a handful of centers where silversmiths deployed regionally distinct modes of ornament 
fusing local artistic practices with innovations ventured to suit the tastes of British patrons. Peninsular India's primary production center was the administrative and commercial capital of Madras, where Hindu gods and their grand processions decorated these objects, which were commonly referred to as Swami silver, Swami meaning gods. Madras's most prominent firm was founded in 1849 by Scotsman Peter Orr, and an indication of just how highly regarded his company's wares would become is the fact that four ceremonial gifts presented to the Prince of Wales during his 1875 to 76 visit to India were in fact commissions from this firm. Our service that you see here is a very slight variation of one of those gifts, which was given to the future Edward VII by the Maharaja of Indore. Like that more famous service, which is no longer traceable, this example was a presentation gift inscribed to the Madras Railway's first locomotive carriage and wagon superintendent in order to commemorate his two decade tenure in that post. Marked 1876, this gift must have been made very soon after the nearly identical set was given to the Prince of Wales. The heavy double walled um, set consists of a tray bearing a hot water pot, teapot, milk jug and sugar bowl. Its decoration, both incised on the tray and in repoussé on the vessels, features Vishnu and his avatars, select other deities, and lively festival processions. The quality of this intricately chaste work, of its intricately chaste workmanship, is of the very highest quality, and its delightful details are innumerable. In, in all honesty, I, I don't think that there is that exists a, a finer example of Swami silver. So I'm really excited to have, have that up. So turning, uh, now I would, I would, I would re sort of redirect the group to the center of, of that gallery and back to the big uh, howda or el elephant saddle, or really maybe more properly elephant throne. Um, the idea being that the ruler would sit in the, the front compartment of, of this throne, this, this sort of mobile throne um, carried by an elephant and um, one or more attendants would sit in the small compartment behind him bearing um, emblems of regalia, including as you see here, the parasol um, as well as you know, also currently in the gallery, um, other emblems like, like these peacock feathered fly whisk fans. Um, so with, and, and so now turning to the, this, the second of the three objects is, is another piece of regalia that, that we have recently acquired and will be housed in a, in a larger vitrine along, along with these fly whisks. And this is this um, ceremonial uh, silver mace. So, Ceremonial maces um, were, were, as I say, one of the many pieces of elaborate regalia borne by attendants at court ceremonies and in public processions to announce the status of the leader in their midst. Some of these articles like the parasol, which you saw, have their roots in cosmic symbolism and are indicative of a ruler's superhuman status. Others like the fly whisk are more mundane in their origins and still others like the mace are derived from weapons and thus associated with a ruler's martial power. As ceremonial arms, rather than actual weapons for combat, they were often constructed of precious materials, further signaling their subjects' prestige. Indian rulers surely always employed regalia, but its use seems to have proliferated under the Mughals and their successors. Paintings and eventually photographs show kings pres presiding over audiences at court or um, especially in procession, uh, surrounded by extravagant displays of these symbols of authority. A mace strikingly similar to ours um, is among the many emblems borne by attendants of Ram Singh II of Kota 
in a grand processional picture of about 1850 in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum, a painting that you may remember from the Maharaja exhibition. The exquisite workmanship of this particularly large mace, mace's repousse and chaste ornamentation is a match for some of the best pieces in our aforementioned Walter's silver collection. The finials of these implements were frequently articulated with the head of an animal, usually an elephant, lion, or tiger, all of which have ancient associations with kingship in India. The inclusion here of the hare, still very much alive, in the lion's jaws, um, as I, th I think endearing, and, and may tell a story yet to be deciphered. Quite aside from its details, though, this object with, um, has really great physical presence. Its imposing scale and opulently articulated surfaces should intrigue and thrill visitors. It really is. Um, the first time I, I saw this uh, in London, I, I was astounded. And I, I, know, I know everyone else who sees it in person will be. So turning um, now to the third of the three objects, I, I would virtually direct the group's attention back to that northern end of, of the late Indian gallery where the, where the silver is currently installed. And um, here is, is really the, the biggest physical change to the gallery and, and, and really the sort of catalyst um, for, for the larger renovation. And, and what is going to happen here is, is something I've been waiting for now 11 years to happen. And so I'm, I'm really excited. And it is that along this wall, we will get a new wall case. Um, in order to house and display um, a really magnificent uh, example of South Indian painting, and which is the third of these three objects that I want to talk about. Um, and I know you can't see it terribly well here. It's, it's about 50 feet long, a um, couple feet tall. So, so I've made another slide here that at least breaks it up into quarters so that you can get a little bit better sense of, of, of the imagery. Uh, when it's in the case, we'll actually be showing about a, a fifth of it at a time. So a, a little less than any one of these four runs that you see here. And um, showing, showing that portion of it at a time will allow us to, to really continually rotate it, our sort of, um, rule of thumb for, for conservation in, in terms of light exposure uh, to pigments is, is a, a rotation of sort of one to four, me meaning you know, in, anything that's out for, for a period of one month, let's see, should then, then really rest in the dark for, for four months. Um, and so we'll be able to keep this on continual rotation, probably rotating each of those sections um, once a year ish, we'll see. Um, so this spectacular narrative or, or legend scroll was created in the 18th century by artists in the Andhra region of South India. And like other such narrative scrolls, it depicts important events from the, legend, from the legendary history of a particular social caste. In this case, the Gaudas, who are the traditional producers and purveyors of toddy, a mildly alcoholic drink concocted from the fermented sap of the Palmyra palm. Scrolls like this were used by storytellers in performances presented to members of the cast whose stories they told, being the same group that had patronized the artwork's creation. These picture shows related the origins of the sponsoring cast and eulogize the exploits of its legendary heroes. I'm showing you here a, an old photograph of, of one of these performances with um, a scroll um, oriented vertically um, rather than our horizontal example here behind the primary storyteller. The performers would unroll the scroll a little at a time so that the image coincided with their recitation of the narrative, which part prose and part poetry was spoken, sung, and chanted, 
and often accompanied by music. Um, it's, it's a long scroll with, with a whole lot going on. Um, and so what I'll do is just show you a few excerpts. Um, the scroll begins with a representation of Ganesha, the elephant headed God of good luck, honored by Hindus at the beginning of any undertaking. Next is the archetypal creation myth, Vishnu lying on the king of the serpents at the bottom of the cosmic ocean, a lotus flower emerging from his navel upon which Brahma appears in order to generate the four quarters of the universe. And then in the third frame, we see another important myth, the gods and the demons churning the milky ocean in order to recover a number of precious items, including the nectar of immortality, and most notable for this particular story, the toddy palm, which you see one of, the, one of these many precious items that's been churned up from the, from the milky ocean. Several prominently placed scenes along the scroll show toddy tapping, production, and distribution. Galdas appear in these scenes climbing palms to collect their sap and selling the fermented toddy and its distillate called arak, primarily to foreigners, including Europeans, who perhaps here are employees of the Dutch East India Company. Um, I'll just point out, I think my little pointer works here, you know, tapping, climbing up the palms, it's happening here and here both. Um, and then these sort of two tavern scenes um, um, with, with the sort of matron um, uh, serving, you know, clearly foreigners here with their funny um, jackets and, and, and hats. Um, here's another scene uh, showing similar. We have, we have one poor soul here actually passed out it seems. Um, but I also wanted to point out this detail um, of the distillation of the toddy into Arak. You can see it uh, boiling um, here in, in a cauldron and then the, the vapors being caught by this, this um, upturned um, copper probably um, um, sort of dome and then the, the distillate then flowing into smaller pots left and right. Um, so, along with scenes like this, many of the episodes along the scroll's length um, depict scenes of battle. And these battles are presumably over the right to produce the toddy. And, and we see one here, um, two principal uh, figures battling, one, one on horse, the other um, in a house on, on an elephant. And they, um, they're, they're having it out, arrows flying, and then and something interesting going on here with a uh, figure climbing the tree who seems, and he seems to be using the tree itself as a weapon. Um, you, you see um, palm fronds flying off the tree um, in order to um, dismember um, 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 warriors below, for example. And my cursor keeps disappearing, but so I'm not going to try anymore. But um, you, you see a, a, a fellow being decapitated and, and other limbs. So, so there's a lot of this battling going on. And, and, and there's a lot for me yet to figure out about the, this narrative. But these, seems to be, these seem to be battles over the sort of technology of, of toddy tapping and, and shoot, who should have the rightful um, possession of it. At the end of the scroll um, is a lengthy inscription in Telugu, the local language, that provides the name of the scroll's lead artist, its patron, and its first performer. The date noted for that performance um, is expressed in terms of a 60-year cycle, but judging from the painting's style, this date probably corresponds either to 1711 or 1771. I'm still trying um, to narrow that down based on style and, and more recently working with um, the conservators doing some pigment analysis um, in, in, in the case that that, um, that analysis might help us uh, to narrow down the exact dating. Of the 20 or so Andhra legend scrolls known to me, 
um, which sort of date from the 17th to the 20th century. Ours is really by far the most remarkable. I'm showing you here a similar excerpt on the right from an example at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, um, which, which also shows um, scenes of toddy tapping there at the bottom as well as distillation. Um, the differences between these more ordinary examples and our scroll with its energetic compositions, sumptuous colors, dense decorative detail, grand scale and extensive use of gold. These differences um, are ones really of quality more than quantity. And I am really certain that once, it, once our scroll is better known and better studied, it will be considered really one of the key monuments in the, in the history of South Indian painting. Um, I've, I've done my 20 minutes. Um, I just wanna show you the, these are the, the three uh, um, here in, in these first 20 minutes. And of course I can't resist. I just have to give you a little teaser. Um, these of course, a, a lot of things will be, will be repositioned in that gallery um, as well as new things coming out. And, and another one of the new things that will come out, not in this current renovation, but perhaps a year from now, um, will be a really spectacular, um, this, this is really large, you can't tell the scale here, but this, this um, sort of silver um, chandelier or, or really lumineer, we, we, we're, the reason it's, it won't be installed yet is we're going to um, re-electrify this, this early 20th century um, chandelier with, with bulbs and, and hang it. I've got a spot picked out for it in, in the corner of the room. And I think that will be a, yet another wondrous thing uh, in the late Indian gallery. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Izzy. That's great, John Henry. They, uh, we'll have to have you back to uh, talk about the chandelier, or did you call it a luminier? I, I, yes, yes, I think that's the Either problem. or. Okay, wow, and, and um, electrification, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, we, if we could start with the scroll, since we're kind of already there, uh, could you talk a little bit about how the scroll came to be a part of the collection? Yeah. Um... I believe um, I believe it was 2009. It was it was right about the time that that I came on board here. And um, so so my predecessor Joe Dye had lined it up um, um, with with a dealer in New York, um, a, a fellow with whom he worked for years and years. A guy named Terrence McInerney, um, who was really one of the premier South Asian art dealers. Um, it was, you know, the, the provenance is, is pretty good. Um, and, and I don't have it in front of me, but it was, um, in a family of, of, of Bombay, I believe Parsi family, um, since I think the early 20th century. Um, and then that family that I think then had relocated to London. Um, but anyway, it's, it's really, you know, it's, I am still trying to get to the bottom of exactly where this is from. I, I did one brief bit of research in the field a couple of years back um, in India and, and went to talk to this sort of real granddaddy of, of, of the, the person who, who knows the most about, about this sort of stuff in Hyderabad. And um, he gave me some, some leads that, that then on a subsequent trip, I hope to go back once all of this craziness is finished, hopefully, and, and really try to figure out a little bit better about where this is from. Like I say, there are, th this type of scroll is pretty well known. There, there are many examples, but, but ours is, is really different than, than most of the rest. The, most of the others are vertical format, although there are other horizontal examples. But, but none of them, you know, is nearly as sumptuous as this. The, the use of gold on this is, is different than, than any of the others. And so it's, it's a big mystery um, and, and, and one that I hope to unravel over the course of, of the coming years. I also have in the back of my mind the, the, the possibility of doing a special exhibition at some point that might be structured around this scroll and and would look at 
traditions of not just of narrative painting in in India, but of performed paintings in India. There there are several many um, distinct regional types of of this of of performers using paintings as as props um, as 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 aids to to storytelling and and looking into that and perhaps even having um, performances uh, in the galleries is, is something I have in mind. That's a long-winded answer. Yeah. Well, um, given, given all the detail, I'm sure you have a lot of work ahead of you. Uh, just a couple of questions that are coming in about the color that you've mentioned, sumptuous, elaborate. Um, is there any symbolic meaning behind the specific coloring to different um, uh, clothing or um, backgrounds, objects? Um, and then specifically, there's a question about, you know, just the... Um, quality. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much degradation of the color. Just wondering if you could speak to any of that. Yeah, I mean, these are all um, really good points that are being made. It is in exceptionally good condition. Um, you know, if, if, if you were to look at it really up close, you, you would see that there's, you know, a fair amount of paint flaking. This is the sort of thing we expect, you know, in some colors um, that happens, you know, um, Worse, worse than with other colors. I mean, in terms of you know symbolism of of colors, um, maybe a little. There's there's not a lot in that. You know, I mean, certainly, I mean, the gold is 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 has the <laughs> carries the the same sort of symbolic value as it does, you know, pretty much the world over of of just being impressive and sumptuous. Um, the, one might notice that that certain <laughs> figures. Figures are different colors, and and there is there is certainly something to that. Um, exactly what there is to that, though, is is one of these mysteries. Um, some of the figures, you know, um, you know, have sort of more believable flesh tones, and then and then one would will notice that other figures are this this deep blue, and perhaps that that's um, what what folks have in mind. Um, that could indicate. Certainly, that 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 figure um, is a deity. You know, certain um, Indian deities are are typically depicted um, as this dark blue, probably best known Krishna, but others as well. So that that could be indicating that, although not necessarily. It could simply be indicating that this is you know a a, a very dark skinned figure. Um, other other figures there there in that in that detail that that's on the screen now towards the left, there are some demons and, and they are purposefully sort of odd colors, including a, a light blue and it's sort of almost magenta. But um, there's, there's I, I've in fact tried to pick apart this narrative by, by tracking, you know, both the skin colors of figures and, and, and the colors of their dress in order to say, oh, this is the same guy here, here and here. And it's really so complex that I think I need some sort of supercomputer to work this out because every time I've tried this, I, I start to get confused. Um, there's so many different figures and, and sort of variations in what they're in how they're colored as well as their dress. So um, more than any well well more than anything, I think that the coloration is just um, meant really to delight right the, the viewer and importantly keep in mind that that these were were meant to be seen from a distance. So those, so those bright um, colors would have helped an audience to, to make out better um, you know, what they were seeing at a distance when, when these were performed. Right. Uh, well, one last question, turning to the mace, um, and I'm not sure if you said this, I might have missed it, but, and I think I can kind of see it better in this angle, but what is the lion holding? In, in its mouth. Sure, I, I, I mentioned it, but but again, I'm not 100% sure. I believe it's meant to be a mm -hmm. hair, you know, meaning, you know, like a, a long-eared rabbit. Um, but I'm not even 100% sure of that. You know, I might, j just like I need to, to talk with, with experts on, on um, sort of colonial period dress and figure out if, if these Europeans depicted on the scroll are really Dutch or maybe they're Portuguese. Um, 
similarly, I, I, I might benefit from, from talking to someone who knows more about the fauna of, of South Asia and, and see if that's really a hair. But yeah, I, for now, I'm going with um, cute little rabbit. Yeah, well, that, that's what I was getting from this angle. Uh, well, John Henry, that is our time. Thank you so much for this peek into what we can expect in the late Indian galleries. And we'll be on the lookout for that um, chandelier. Uh, that should be really interesting. Well, thank you so much, John Henry. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.